Then, DNA creates visualizations from this coded transcript, showing us the strength of connections between constructs during meetups. Now, with five years of data, the discourse patterns found in our analysis have revealed major insights. Recent research has found prompting fosters content-related connections in student discourse and furthers their curiosity. Researchers also use CHAT, cultural historical activity theory, to examine how COVID affected IC4, looking at the tensions created in the usual activity systems of the project. Um, so interesting. I think that it's cool. Show the world that you can do it, okay? All I have to say is that uh, you can make it. Uh, so what to learn as long as you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, then you won't learn it as well. Eu ainda vou falar que a realidade virtual pode ser muito usada para que eles... I really want to learn about culture, different cultures. Our project has withstood the isolating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and served as an outlet for students in quarantine to network with peers from around the world. Student participants adapted to the rapidly changing circumstances by developing innovative solutions to address complex problems within their local and global communities. Yes, congratulations again, IC4. Congratulations. We have a couple more shout outs, then we will give room for everybody to say something um, if they have something to share. So Dr. Hughes' new book, Education and Elitism. If you haven't picked that up, pick it up. <laughs> Congratulations again, Dr. Hughes on that book. Um, the, uh, Jennifer, hey, hi girlfriend. Congratulations on being a part of this. Jennifer, a co was a co was a country co country investigator for Rwanda in the largest study of culture and leadership across 140 countries and over 70 participants, including education leaders. Jenny, you want to share a little bit about that? Um, well, I'm actually excited because I see Ruth Anaya is also on the call, and Ruth is joining us from Canada. And Ruth has been a part of this Globe study before and is another co country investigator for Rwanda and Kenya. Ruth, can you wave so people can see you? Um, but this is an exciting um, study, the Globe Study Project. And um, if you wanna reach out to Ruth or I to learn more about it, but this year more countries are featured in Sub-Saharan Africa than in previous studies. And so that is what is really exciting. And it really does study um, leadership. And in this particular study, they're looking at how gender affects um, changes in culture and leadership and um, the role of trust and the role of culture in, in leadership. And so um, it's going to be the largest study of its kind. They'll be release, starting to release data next summer, but they just finished the data collection. So Ruth and I got to be a part of that. And I know we had several education leaders participate um, who are managers in, in Rwanda. So we're, we'll be excited to learn from the data that we'll be receiving in um, next summer. Ruth, do you want to add anything? I'm kind of putting you on the spot. It's okay. I'm happy to share what yeah. um, excited me a lot was the fact that my PhD actually was the first, um, I say Black Africa, because it doesn't cover North Africa, nor does it cover the white Anglo section of South Africa. So it was the first Black Africa study of the globe that was a comprehensive country study. So it really then there is the largest um, country study of any country in on the African continent and other than the North African. So now what they're doing is they're extending it further into particular areas of interest, as Jennifer has said, in the area of gender and trust. So it, it's, I think, highly relevant to all areas. My area of focus um, with the globe was the financial area as well as agriculture. And then I duplicated and replicated that to the civic sector of health and education as well. And um, so right now in the current study, they're covering every industry. So it's not confined as it was in the original study. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Dr. Hughes, did you want to say a little bit about your book before we dive in? Well, just to thank you for highlighting it and for promoting it here at this forum. Um, the, the book focuses on 
the whole construct of elitism. What do we actually mean by elitism? It problematizes that. And then it gives a, an historical overview of schools and universities, private schools, international schools, state systems, questions of access and lack thereof in South Africa, India, the United States, in Australia, and in the United Kingdom. Uh, there's a chapter on 2020 as a kind of turning point for all questions around elitism, not only because of the uh, social impact of COVID, but the um, social justice movements that have become uh, so prescient and uh, salient uh, in certainly, you know, this year and last year. And it ends with about six sort of suggestions. So it's, uh, you know, um, my only hope when I write a book is that it's well written. Uh, and I, I think it's better written than the previous one. But uh, I'll, I'll try and make the, the next publication uh, even more succinct. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Uh, Ruth, you're muted, but we will get the link to his his book. We'll put that in the chat. There it goes. Perfect. <laughs> Wait, did I just put in the waiting room again? Yes. <laughs> learning, learning. Grace, people. Thank you. <laughs> I show grace, you show grace. We all learn. All right. I think that's it for anybody else have some great news they want to share. We don't want to overlook anybody's great news. We'd like to celebrate you. No? I'll give a shout out to Flavia since she's on the call because I've seen it and I'm sorry we don't have it here, Flavia, but uh, Flavia did a training um, in Uganda for teachers um, training together. Uh, we've had them speak before and she put together her own video about the training and it was just top notch. Um, Flavia, how many teachers did you train? Do you recall? Are you, are you still there? Yes, I am. I am. Sorry, I'm in transit. That's why my camera is off. Okay. But um, hello, everybody. I hope you're able to see me. Yes. I was able to train 30 teachers. It was a very fast seminar here. It was successful. It was great. We had great feedback from the teachers. It was really, really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't, uh, who haven't gone back to look at our resources, if you want to know more about teachers training together, in our resources, you'll find you'll find uh, information about them. We always send that out after each forum, a link to that. Thank you, Jen. Should we move on and bring in our guest? Hello, exciting. Ooh, finally, our main event of the day. Um, Dr. June, would you like to go first? Ruth, do you yes, want to well, address? welcome to everyone. Good to hear you. Um, Hold on, Dr. June. I, I'm going to introduce you. I wanted to oh. make sure that you're okay oh. going first. <laughs> and, and, oh, no. Oh, I see. And is it okay if I show a PowerPoint short one or is that absolutely. okay? Can I absolutely. share? Yeah, won't take yes. long. Okay. You can. Absolutely. Thank you, Ruth. You can. <laughs> did you want to introduce yes. me? Yes, let me okay. introduce you. So, oh, wonderful. Okay. Dr. June, Dr. Uh, June Schmeider Ramirez. She holds PhD in policy analysis from Stanford University. She is the current director of the PhD in global leadership program at the University of Pepperdine, which Jennifer and I and a few of us in the group are a part of. She leads the annual international intercultural conference on global leadership in Central America. She is the co-author of several books, the most popular being the Spill It, Power Metrics, Untangling the Organizational Environment with the Spill It, sp I can never say that word, Spill, spill it. it, with the Spill It Leadership <laughs> Tool. I use that tool for my uh, comprehensive exam or qualifying exam, oh. it's an exciting tool. 
um, how, co how current research centers on university to university alliances, the leadership crisis, global competencies, and possessing a global mindset. As a result of this, she has a course called ED, EDD 75 that addresses emerging educational design for global universities in which students in which university students from developed countries collaborate with international university students from low income countries to conduct research and or teaching and consulting opportunities in the interconnected system of learning at the university level. This provides opportunity for future employment of both parties at university level. Thank you so much, Dr. June. We had conversations and about how our interests aligned over the course of the program and I'm so excited to have you and to hear what you have to say and how far you've come with this idea. Oh, Welcome. Thank you. thank you. And I think I like spill it better. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> could it says it's disabled for screen sharing. Maybe I need to be able. Uh, we will make you a co-host in. Like oh, one. okay. Two, wow. Three. Okay. So <laughs> while Ruth is um, setting that up, just uh, a reminder that as the speakers are sharing, um, I'm going to put a link here in the chat of a Word document that hopefully, or Google document that hopefully everyone can access, where you can just put your, pose your questions. Um, this is also good for us to have a record of these questions as it helps us shape future conversations. So, um, Please let me know if you have any problems accessing that document. Um, okay. Okay. Can you see that pretty much? We can. Oh, good. Okay. Um, let me get into presentation. I wanted to mention, first of all, that uh, thank you for inviting me today. And I see a lot of people here uh, that I certainly know. Um, certainly Ruth, Jennifer. I certainly know Dr. Hamilton pretty well since we've been working together for a long time and good to see him here. Dr. Espino, I noticed I've worked with, and I really love what you're doing with IC4. Uh, this is a really the first time I've, I've seen a lot of it. Uh, so thank you. And Dr. Conrad Hughes, and I'm sure I'm missing people, but thank you so much. Um, I wanted to mention that, first of all, the PhD in global leadership and change at Pepperdine started with a contest uh, which I lost, actually. So uh, that's how the beginning was. I presented it at Waves of Innovation in 2015, and there were 160 applicants. They chose eight, so I was one of the eight, but we, we lost, and uh, it was, a, I think they picked three or so. And then I was walking out of the auditorium that night. It was raining, it was dark, and uh, I, I felt, gee, that's something. And then I got on my iPhone, started blinking, and it said three words. It said, bring this back. And the note was from President Andrew Benton, who was uh, then the president of the university. So once that happened, then we could go forward and it was approved finally. So it just shows you, you just never know. So uh, I wanna mention, I'm gonna change countries a little bit. I've been very impressed with what you're doing in Africa. But the main countries that I've been involved in is cent are Central America, Mexico, um, areas in South America. So I'm very um, interested in the works of Ryan Craig, uh, who spoke to us uh, three years ago at Pepperdine. And also there's a new outfit called Sintana, which has signed a um, uh, sort of an agreement with ASU, and they're looking at university to university uh, kind of collaborations also. So I've been kind of looking at those two groups. It started with um, when I met Laura down in, we have a conference in Belize called the ICGL conference, and Laura could go to the eighth grade, but then what happens is in Belize, uh, you have to pay, the parents have to pay for secondary. So what happens is she stops at second at eighth grade as many, many hundreds of students do. And then they, they work in the tourism industry typically or construction. 
So with that, what, what ICGL did was we gave computers and then we learned that routers uh, and also towers are important too. So we had to move in that direction. And a lot of our Pepperdine students, such as Matthew Heiss and others, uh, worked to look at the towers that were available. And that's where we really had to do a lot of work. So it was really Laura that started it. Um, the problem is, as Ryan is saying, is there will be a need for more collaboration. And he feels on a university to university basis. And we know that's happening a lot, but he's saying that this has to be happening even more. So he's a speaker up here in uh, Santa Monica and a very interesting person. He's on Twitter also. So we do know, all of us know the history of Coursera and some of the online programs. Um, it's amazing how many students they had, just hundreds of thousands. Uh, but what we're thinking of is more of a student to student uh, collaboration. We're not looking at signing off on agreements as much, although we'll probably have to do that. But we want to have kind of a student to student uh, kind of collaboration. We do know also that uh, Douglas Becker started with Sylvan uh, Studies and went into Laureate and went in, it's 1998, was a nonprofit. And that's the history there. And in 2007, uh, this company was acquired. And so he's doing different things now. So uh, that was in 2007. So it's a growing industry, as we know, but the completion rate on some of the, the companies is not as high as they would like. Uh, Ryan has put together kind of technical skills and cognitive skills, and this is a list uh, which I won't read, but you can see at the top information technology and computer science. And uh, some of the areas where, say, Laura, as I mentioned, is working is hospitality, food and tourism, and some of these are the lowest paid. For example, in Belize, uh, the hourly rate is around $2 an hour, two to three, and that's in uh, construction and other areas. So they have a ways to go. Um, we also note that now there's a lot of motivation to tie, and all of you know this, employment to uh, education. And that's even more now after COVID and people are not taking jobs now, which is interesting. And so they're gonna have to be really thinking about the jobs they're gonna be offering. Ryan also has mentioned the importance of boot camps and apprenticeships, uh, income share. And so this is the type of thing where if students do wanna get a job now, what we're finding in the, even in the PhD is that they're, they're asked whether they've done any kind of teaching. And so once we have this teaching experience that they're going to be go, looking at, then it's gonna be easier for them to find a position, we think. Um, he talks about boot camp programs and income share programs, uh, employer pay. Typically, a lot of the internships are not paid, but uh, we're thinking of uh, at least the students would get experience in teaching, say, at University of Belize. And they're very excited about this idea also. And we would also hear from them that they would, they would uh, put together classes, maybe 20 minute classes, modules or videos and show them to our students. So they would get the same benefit. It would be a collaboration. Um, there's a lot of default in many of the programs, as many of you know. Um, so we know that, uh, well, Ryan especially feels that the student loan needs to be looked at and so do many others. And so, uh, he's interested in that area. So there's a lot of sobering numbers out there. But the main thing we all agree on is the lifelong learning that, you know, these programs would get into STEM and some of the areas you're, you're interested in. And we've been looking at your program and we're very impressed with what uh, your students are doing, uh, Eric. And so thank you for that effort. Appreciate that. So here's the main question we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at, uh, and it's still in the design stage, we have EDD 785, which we're offering as a class. Uh, so students there will help design some of the aspects of the program. So it's going to be kind of constructivist from student base. 
So how could Pepperdine PhD students be partnered with University of Latin America or University of Belize for mutual benefits? And this slide was taken from the yearly ICGL, International Center for Global Leadership Conference that we have every, every June to discuss uh, issues of international importance. So the university to university alliance is supporting, actually we're starting with secondary students as a first step. The reason this is true because in a lot of, many of you know that in Central America, you stop at eighth grade because of the cost of the secondary school. So we're actually supporting students at the secondary level and we bring down you know, computers and look at the towers down there because they have less uh, infrastructure. So we're starting there so that they're ready to go into uh, other universities there. We know that many of them wanna to go to the University of Belize and then it would be really cost prohibitive to come up here, but we think you know the online coordination will be important and we're learning from other um, you know, companies as to how they're doing that. We tried, um, we have been helping with uh, giving away computers for the last seven years in Belize. This is a picture of um, Roberts Grove, which is down there and where we, we meet for about a week of the ICGL. And we give away computers, that, but we've learned a lot about you just can't give away computers. <laughs> that you, you've got towers <laughs> that you have to put together. Um, we have some of our students who work for Nearpod and some others that have helped us with the towers and some other infrastructure. So we've learned a lot, and we, but we're still giving away computers. And some of the students that do have the computers, they have gone on to higher ed. So we're very proud of them down there. So this is, the, this is on, online, International Center for Global Leadership. Uh, and a lot of our students are in that, and we, we do this on a regular basis. The other thing we do is we have a global leadership um, inventory, and the students uh, have taken that, and it's um, I can give that to you if you email me. But you can take it, and it's free. Um, it's a scoring of 250 as a top score. But what it looks at is cultural agility, traditional uh, global leadership, and also whether you're truly a global leader, you know, in this inventory, you know, there are many, many inventories. So uh, we've used that as to, you know, pick out certain people who want to be leaders and see how they, they score on, the, on this inventory. It's one of many, but it's very interesting. So this is um, uh, kind of a picture of uh, one of the rooms in our conference down in Roberts Grove where we do meet. And so uh, it's a very exciting time down there. Uh, when the Wi-Fi is working, we have that issue. So what we're looking at the benefits, teaching experience for our graduates, which I think is important. Also benefits to the students of the class, the Latin American and Central American students would be also putting together uh, kind of what I would call modules of teaching. And then we would share them in di for different classes and there would be structures for both. So that's kind of our design based on, uh, you know, Bloom's taxonomy or, you know, we would share the theories we're using to put together the learning design. So uh, here is my email. If you'd like any ideas, we'd certainly be willing to uh, certainly look at them and I noticed several people are on the line that have gotten their doctorates and so congratulations to them. So that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, let me stop share. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. June, for the exciting work you're doing. Sure. Uh, anybody have a couple of questions before we wrap out Dr. June for now? Don't go, don't run away, Dr. June. <laughs> oh, I'm not going. No, I'm not going away. Okay. Anybody, we take a couple of questions right now, if anybody has any. Oh, Eric has a question. <laughs> Ruth, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, uh, Dr. June can share, maybe just li list, uh, in addition to example, distributing computers and setting up towers, what are some other things that, that might be 
part of the university to university alliance in terms of specific activities that, mm -hmm. for example, if someone was interested in, in doing dissertation work or they wanted to know how the alliance may be or could potentially contribute to some of the, uh, the shared objectives and missions that we have, uh, what are some of the other activity sets that might yeah. be that might fit UT UA? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Eric. Uh, one of the uh, issues that you mentioned is the dissertation, and I see an activity where students from, say, University of Belize, could share their dissertation, and then uh, from Pepperdine they would share their dissertation. So we would attend the. Um, uh, we would attend the meetings of the University of Belize and they would attend our meetings to, to kind of get a joint collaboration. So I think that's important. Um, I think a second objective, uh, working with the mission of the univ our university and their university is to have a uh, workshop on the values and objectives of both universities and then how they might mesh and then how there might be kind of uh, joint activities we can do together. And then the third one is, we do have the conference in Belize, the International Center for Global Leadership. So we would invite, say, several classes from the University of Belize to present at this particular conference. And they would also meet students from Pepperdine. Uh, and so there would be a joint collaboration there. So I would certainly be interested in your ideas, uh, Eric, because I know you've, you've done this for many years. So, uh, you know, those are kind of our beginning thoughts. The benefit we have is that we have had a conference there for seven years. So we have had a lot of relationships. And as you know, Eric, it's not just the university. It's the government and its companies surrounding uh, Latin America and Central America. So one objective we have to have is to get to know the government. We have had uh, the government workers come and meet with us, uh, but, and also we need to get to know more about the companies down there. As you may be aware, they do change companies and there's not many huge companies there, but we do know Digicel and we do know BTL, we do know the tourism businesses. The tourism, of course, is very large, but there's also, uh, I see an objective would be to get to know the people at Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, since that's huge. And that may pay some of the students uh, higher uh, in their technology section. So there's some beginning ideas, but we'd welcome anyone's ideas here uh, and also yours, Eric. So thank you. June, June thanks for the answer. And, and quickly, one quick idea is that when you, and thank you for asking for ideas, one is that when you are in some joint meetings with um, university planners or leaders, um, uh, we're going to hear hear more from Conrad. Uh, I don't know if he's specifically going to go into his, uh, much about the the book he just shared, but that might be an interesting frame of reference for some discussions uh, oh, or an okay. agenda for a meeting, parsing mm -hmm. through some of the issues because they they're pervasive in how we structure and think about education. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Uh, yeah, this is the first time I've seen Conrad Hughes, and I'm looking forward to looking uh, at his book. Uh, so that would be very, very, very useful. Thank you. We could require it for everyone to be good, too, possibly. Okay, thank you. So for some reason, he's nodding. He is nodding. Oh, it depends on what if there's a cut rate, cut rate amount. Um, I think I put my email in there and I'm always willing to hear different ideas. This is very new. And as you know, change happens slowly sometimes, but now that we have a relationship with a lot of, with, I'd say it's a triumvirate, the government, um, actually the university and the companies. And one thing we all know is that the companies are quite small down there in some of the countries in Central America. So we have to really kind of get a kind of a three-legged stool rather than just the universities because they're all tied together as we all know. Okay, thank you for your time and I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Absolutely. And of these ideas, even though 
Dr. June is talking about South America. We are here to leverage each other's experiences, leverage each other's um, ideas and work together. So it might not be specific for Africa, but there's things here that those of us that are from Africa could uh, borrow or sure. partner with her to build on. So yes. we, we are hoping that anything we share here is inspiring everybody else in their own location to do better or to do something new or to take a different approach to whatever they're doing in the education field or yeah. outside the education field. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. So I, really, I actually wondered, right, just one last point. I think that last comment Dr. June made about the triumvirate, I think that was really important because in the past, in some of our conversations, we've talked about the role of business. I think Dr. Ty uh, Houston had mentioned that as well. And so if you are trying to improve things for your secondary students, say, um, and you might be in a remote area, but what are the companies that are around you? What are the, the, the communications companies that are around you? Might there be an opportunity to partner with them and your local government and your school in a way to pursue projects uh, that you want to do, um, because we know, especially the connections to employment are so important um, post-secondary. Mm -hmm. So um, again, that's just another way as you're brainstorming projects in your own country that uh, you can start mm -hmm. to expand outside of, expand your thinking. So thank you, Dr. June. Yeah, no, that's a good point, uh, Jennifer. One thing we do always do is we always invite government and business uh, as well as university people to our conferences. That's just a simple way of getting to know everybody. And I think you're exactly right. We can't just invite people from the universities and the schools. We have to kind of widen that. So I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. And Ty, that's where I learned it from was Ty Houston. So she's on the call, I think somewhere. Um, the other thing someone mentioned was Arizona State. Um, I just want to mention Arizona State. They're having a conference starting on Monday. And even though there's, they're, they've signed with a lot, like hundreds of people, there's some ideas they have that are very interesting. And one company that I've been following is Centana. Centana wants to, hook, wants to have a connection with every university. We know there's around 20,000 universities in the world. And there's only a thousand that say are put up there, say the top U.S. News and World Report. But I've been kind of watching uh, ASU because they're doing some very interesting things. Not all of them work, but if you sign up with a hundred things, maybe five things will work. It's the Elon Musk way of working. So I think it's important to kind of tie into a lot of conferences. And as I would recommend, you might want to join the ASU conference. I think it's with no cost just to see what's happening there. And to, I think they have different conferences there. So that's what I try to do is join different conferences to kind of keep up on, on ideas. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. June. We can just give you a hand of applause. Thank you. And then we'll have more discussions around what Dr. June shared in our breakout rooms. But we're going to jump to our next speaker, Dr. Mark. Mabo Michael Kwati. Did I say that right, Kwati? Yes, I think you got that right. All right. <laughs> the first name is Michelle. People so, okay. always say Michael. <laughs> Michelle. Oh, but it's, it's Michelle. French. Francophone? Yeah. Francophone? It's a French name. Okay. Was it Francophone or was it Anglophone? Mabo say Anglophone. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, that was a little French, right? Trying to polish my French a little bit. So Dr. Mabo holds a master's in nursing education from the University of Boya in Cameroon and a PhD from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. He is the founder of Health Research Foundation Boya Cameroon. He was the pioneer, the pioneer head of nursing from 2016 to 2018 and Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs from 2016 to 2019 at the Biaka University Institute of Boya in Cameroon also. Dr. Mabo is a part-time lecturer at the University of Boya, which is different from the Institute, um, and an adjunct faculty research and biostatistics 
at the College of Nursing and Health Professions at Dressel University, Pennsylvania. He has led curriculum development in a wide range of health and nursing subject areas. Dr. Mabo's primary research interest is in the area of improving health care through health professions, education, active learning, and gen geriatrics. He is also introducing the concept of interdisciplinary clinical simulation in health professions education in Cameroon at Biaka University Institute in Boya. Dr. Kwati or Dr. Michelle or Dr. Mabo, <laughs> I want to welcome you very much to this forum. Thank you for pulling out of your very busy schedule to make sure that you bless us with your presence and um, uh, give to us the knowledge that you've richly earned through hard work and many, many, many challenges. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rose. And I am grateful for this opportunity to be here and to listen, learn from different people with different experiences and to share what I have also learned and I continue to learn. Um, Ruth caught me at a very busy time and we had to go back and forth before I was able to um, commit to taking part in this forum. And I'm happy I did after uh, listening to the introductions and listening to Dr. June there. There is, I mean, it's a reminder that there is always a lot to learn when you sit in an intellectual gathering like this. Um, as you have heard from my profile, I've done a lot of work in education, especially health professions education at uh, Biaka University. We used to exist as um, three semi-autonomous uh, professional schools. And then in 2016, the Ministry of Higher Education gave us the authorization to operate as a university institute. So I was given that on an enviable task to bring these institutions together into a university structure and transform the programs to align with the expectations of the Ministry of Higher Education. And I think that one of the things that made that a bit easier is the partnerships that we had established with um, other institutions, both locally and internationally. So that helped a lot. We could um, bring in expertise that we didn't have and we could tap into, oops, excuse me. Okay. And we could tap into other resources that were not readily available within our settings. So one of the things that we have really picked up some good experience in recent over the recent years is in uh, global classrooms, which we carried out with uh, the College of Nursing and Health Professions and the Labo Business College, both at Drexel University. So in this concept, uh, we have our students and their students learning in the same classroom and being taught by the same professors. So it's a good experience for the students and faculty to have that um, international exposure and connections. And in the course of that, some of the lessons we learned there were related to the challenges of um, the differences in uh, curriculum structures. So you had to work to find alignments, to find areas where the uh, two groups of students could learn together. The programs were not always align perfectly. So that was one of the things that we had to deal with. We had to deal with the issue of time zones. The East Coast is um, on average five hours ahead of, uh, no, behind Cameroon time. So there is just a limited amount of daytime hours that the two groups can work together. Then we have the perennial problem of internet uh, disruptions, electricity disruptions, that also uh, posed a challenge. And we usually found ways to work around that. We use synchronous and asynchronous measures as the um, circumstances permitted us. I think in the course of that, we had our students 
build their capacity in a lot of uh, different areas. We also had our faculty who may not have had the opportunity to travel before have access to different university resources. And I think that the students too from the US side were opportune to have an uh, insight into the way they, their professions or what they were studying for was practiced in different countries and in different cultures. And these days when we are talking about cultural competence in almost everything we do, I think that's a very key thing to key um, achievement or accomplishment. We would have loved to, we have tried to have student to student projects, which we think would make that kind of interaction even more valuable. They may learn in the same classroom, they may share experiences, but it will be very, very um, nice to have these two groups of students work together on a project. And we see what comes out of that. We had, a, we attempted that with a school in Australia with a group of nursing students on both sides. They did a little project and the challenges of the time zone as well made it really hard for us to continue with those. But this is something that we are seeking to develop within our uh, current partnerships. So I think that, um, and I believe from this experience that we have had that global classrooms are really a way to go. It is quite cheap. You don't have to, you are, you are not um, creating new courses. You are not um, asking the, the professors to go out of their usual schedule. We are all faculty members and we know what it means when they come and tell you to add a few more hours to your session. You could really start rioting. So we fit that within what they are already doing. So it works well for everybody. And another essential thing is this, um, is this a faculty coming up to want to do this. They want their students to have that international experience. And then in this COVID era, when you cannot travel and when we do not know when we will start traveling and then the security situation that could be in some countries, this offers really a good way to go and I think if we can leverage technology, I was uh, throughout this week, I was at um, Arizona State University. So I'm happy that uh, you mentioned what they were doing there. And I saw that um, there was somebody here from ASU. They are really doing, yeah, I think that's uh, Kim work. Yeah, I was really impressed with what they are doing with the, um, technology, online learning, it was just amazing, it was mind blowing. So I see a lot of opportunity if we could leverage technology in this kind of uh, inter-university and inter-college partnerships, because there are many things that we will not be able to do physically because of uh, maybe the issue of resources, financial resources, and so many other things, maybe bureaucracy and all of that. But with technology, we could really bridge those gaps students could have a virtual visit in their different areas of practice or learning. And that will contribute so much to their learning. The other challenge is that I think that the potential for uh, joint degrees brings is the issue of quality. When a university is thinking about partnering on a joint degree program with another university, if they are both at the same level, they are both in the same country, that could be easier because they are assured of the level of quality in each other's uh, operations. But when you are talking about intercontinental, maybe in one part of the world and another, the issue of quality comes in. I, I mean, can we guarantee that this delivery would meet the same standards that all our programs have been meeting? So that poses a lot of challenges and we have taken so many years to work around that. And we have not yet succeeded to have a joint degree with an international partner. So there is that commitment in their different mission statements, but the devil is in the details. And that's one of the key issues, the quality. Then the cost. If a program in the, in the UK, for example, is about 15,000 pounds, that is way above the, the reach of the average student in, I think, in Africa and at times even in the same UK. So if we are partnering, what would the cost look like? 
how would that be subsidized? If we find a grant to maybe jumpstart the program, how are we going to sustain it? So that's a key issue that has um, held us back from developing our partnerships into full um, degree programs that has left us still operating at these intercourse exchanges. Then we also have to deal at times with the uh, institutional dynamics, the bureaucracy, the politics within institutions. It happens and we have to live with it. There is at times some people in the administration who may not believe that that is the way to go. Maybe it's not the time to invest in that. And all of those um, uh, issues affect the progress of um, collaborations uh, between institutions. Um, I would also add here that our collaboration has, is also local. Because when we talk about uh, institutional collaborations, one of the things that happens in Africa in, uh, across sectors is that there is more collaboration between African institutions and institutions out of the continent than between institutions on the continent. And I think it's, uh, it's a wasted opportunity for, um, for intra-African collaboration in all aspects. So we have also worked to establish partnerships with institutions on the continent and also within the country. And some of the models for these joint um, degrees and diplomas have worked better at this level than at the international level. For example, my institution is able to, uh, has partnered with smaller institutions in the country and we have jointly issued diplomas and degrees with them. And we too are also jointly issuing degrees with the University of Boya because um, as a university institute, we don't have the charter yet to issue the degrees on our own. So a state university must be involved in the process. And that state university is the University of Boya. So we issue our bachelor's and um, postgraduate degrees with the University of Boya. So that happens. And then we use the businesses. I think uh, in a presentation, Dr. June was talking about that collaboration too, with businesses to move um, this kind of uh, learning forward and this improve students' experiences. That's something that we have done very well. We have collaborated with communities. We have uh, partnerships with communities because we have programs that require us sending students into communities. So we have this uh, established these connections with the traditional authorities, with traditional councils in those communities. We work with them as well as the businesses. So right now, we are focusing a lot on faculty development and to improve the, um, the uh, capacity of faculty members to engage internationally. Because that's one thing, to be able to connect and work with people globally. The weakness is that most of the faculty would not have traveled and you need to find traveling in a way it's very educative. I always say one trip you make abroad is like a whole university degree. And so when people have not traveled, they have that limitations. So we are trying to develop the capacity of faculty to reach out, build these networks and collaborate on projects beginning even just from what they are teaching and then maybe to research projects, to funded projects. We have been successful in one area, which is um, e-learning again. We, the current project that we are working on with um, two institutions in Cameroon and Drexel University, which is funded by the US Embassy, was to develop capacity, e learning capacity in higher education. So we had higher institutions nominate their faculty and their academic staff for academic administrators for training on how to use e learning. Because when COVID hit, we were expected to move online. But I can assure you that more than 98 or 99% of the institutions had no capacity to fully deliver online. 
So it was a shock to the system. And we had this project and there were two main courses. First, there was a course on online teaching and learning, and then another course on course design and development. So we trained them and they had completed the program. And now we are looking at a model to sustain that learning and to continue to give them support for a certain period while they, they start initiating change within their institutions. And one of the areas where we um, are in need there is to leverage open educational resources. And we are looking at that. We have set up a, a website and a community of practice to continue doing that. So these are some of the things that uh, we are doing. I am trying to stay close to the theme as possible. These are some of the things that we have been trying to do um, with collaboration with other institutions. And those are the challenges that we have faced. And that uh, briefly is our story. And I am ready to take questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is great. You you really nailed you nailed all those things that we are really looking to 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 develop through this this project uh, through this program. So thank you for for going so deeply. Um, anybody have any questions for Dr. Michelle before we jump into Kim Welch did in the document. Kim, okay. you want to just yeah. ask your question? So um, for Michelle, thank you so much. It's I think some of the projects I'm working on are aligned. I actually work at Arizona State University, but I work for the MasterCard Foundation. And right now I'm training uh, about 50 faculty, most of them spread across Africa and um, at, at various institutions. I think we have about seven or eight institutions in Africa that I'm training. And we're, um, I'm, we're trying to teach the Arizona State model of online education as an aspirational thing, and then also trying to work on the regional context of, you know, connectivity issues and things like that. Um, so I'm wondering which institutions in Africa have the strongest online programs and what makes them strong in your opinion, the things that you've seen, I mean, within your realm. I think generally um, in the Southern Africa, that's South Africa, and um, the North African countries really have um, good programs. And I think that the very first thing is they have uh, more stable internet available. And secondly, they have had a longer period of uh, interaction, university to university interactions with uh, some of the big name institutions. They have had joint programs with um, bigger universities in Europe and America for longer than uh, the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Then um, in Kenya, that I have actually, we have actually have had some collaboration with, one of the things that I saw that helped was the, um, the I'll call it um, commitment at the highest levels of uh, the university management. And they devoted the resources to build a virtual platform for the university. I think it's one of the areas that is lacking in most of the um, institutions in Cameroon and in the sub-Saharan belt. There is the awareness that this is important, but for the resources needed to uh, build this capacity are usually not available, either because it is not really prioritized or because um, they just can't afford it. Excellent, thank you so much, that's helpful. Um, and I agree with you with some of the things I've seen, some of the span, we've seen some institutions that didn't even have a learning management system, they didn't know what that was. And then others who had fully built out learning management systems um, and such. So thank you for your thoughts, that's really helpful. I took notes. You're welcome. Any other questions? Or oh, one more question. <laughs> All right, let's jump in and bring in Dr. Hughes. So Dr. Hughes holds a PhD in English literature and a doctor of education 
Um, Dr. Hughes is a campus and secondary school principal at the International School of Geneva, the oldest international school in the world. He has served mm -hmm. as school principal director of education, international baccalaureate diploma program coordinator and teacher in schools in Switzerland, France, India, and the Netherlands. Dr. Hughes is also a member of the advisory board for the University of the People, senior fellow of UNESCO International Bureau of Education and research assistant at the University of Geneva's Department of Psychology and Education. And he teaches philosophy. He led the publication of guiding principles for learning in the 21st century with UNESCO. Dr. Hughes' most recent book, as we've already discussed, is Education and Elitism. His research interests are in 21st century education, prejudice, critical thinking, international education, and assessments. Dr. Hughes, thank you again so much for making the time to be here and for sharing with us. We always love when you come. We always get inspired and uh, motivated to do better. So thank you and over to you. Thank you very much, Ruth. So as Ruth pointed out, uh, I'm, a, I'm a head of school and I'm facing what I think we're all facing, which is some critical questions about the, the relevance, uh, the purpose and the ultimate uh, success, for want of a better term, of what we're doing with our students. We've developed our own program called the Universal Learning Program which is based on life-worthy, future-proof competences. In other words, what we think the most important competences, the competence is a unity of knowledge, skill, and attitude. It's much more than skill, okay? It's attitude, knowledge, and skill. What the most important competences are for today's world and possibly tomorrow's. And in order to operationalize this program, the Universal Learning Program, which is really based on a number of projects that students do, and a whole assessment system on competences, life-worthy, future-proof competences. We partnered up with UNESCO's International Bureau of Education, and uh, Dr. Hamilton uh, actually spearheaded that partnership from the UNESCO side and was responsible for the first uh, UNESCO audit of our program. So it's always great to reconnect with him and his team. Um, now, the Universal Learning Program is a creative, innovative effort to ensure that the education that our students are receiving at the International School of Geneva is preparing them for much more than performance on dry, narrow academic tasks. Because as we all know, what you need to thrive, to be efficient, what you need for human flourishing it's, it's much more than academia. There's, there's more to a person's CV than test scores. Well, maybe I should rephrase that. There's more to a person's life than test scores, but what a CV relates uh, is not always the full picture. So that's just a bit of background. Now I'm gonna break down my, 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 my short intervention here into three parts. The first is an observation. The second, is uh, an analysis and the third is some conclusion and if you like an action plan that we've designed so let's start with the observation i was at a, a principal's training uh, a couple of years ago and we were told by a young entrepreneur who was actually a high school dropout uh, who, who was brought in to address the principals and what school had taught him and what school had not taught him. He said, you know, it's really important that as a head of school, you meet every single student, no matter how many students you have. It's worth the investment. It's worth the time. So I set about doing this. And to this day, I have 10 minutes uh, one-on-ones with every student, you know, which and they're close to a thousand in my school, but I make the time for it to happen. And something had struck me and it's clearly becoming more and more of a problem. It's what high school students about to enter their final examinations, so the very senior students, what they have to say about the school experience. 
And the first word that comes up is stress, right? Um, but I think that this is not a stress that is necessarily healthy and motivational. It's actually becoming excessive psychological stress because of the pressure that's on them. The second, uh, it's all about deadlines and about examinations. This is in a context where we're offering the IB diploma program. Our, our ULP goes up to year 11, but the last two years of schooling, 12 and 13, uh, we revert to the IB diploma, which is, is a very uh, forward-looking and um, sort of holistic approach. But I would imagine that you'd find something similar from students doing advanced placements, A-levels, uh, the maturité, uh, other types of baccalaureate. Uh, examination boards around the world are leaving students with an impression of stress and deadlines, first and foremost, for the large part. Okay, Let's carry on with the observations. Another observation I made in meeting these students, which are really based on coaching conversations, you know, about what, what's your goal? How do you see yourself getting there? Um, why is this important to you? Um, so many students had dropped activities that they were passionate about because they couldn't fit them into their busy high school schedule. I used to play piano and then I stopped. And, well, um, you know, I was doing competitive sports, but then I, I, I couldn't carry on because of you know, the exams. Yes, I, I wanted to do arts, but uh, the feeling was that, you know, it would probably be better for me to focus on, uh, you know, STEM subjects and this type of thing. So, so far, two observations. One is that there is a high school system that is extremely stressful uh, and narrow for students. And secondly, that it doesn't allow them to pursue many of the passions that they have outside of school. A few more observations, um, and this is away from the meetings I was having with students. It's what it does to teaching. So if you think about school, I mean, in primary school, there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of creativity. Students, um, they doodle, they draw, they sing, they play games. I mean, they even get to sleep, have siestas, right? Um, and in middle school, you know, there are probably quite a few projects going on all sorts of innovative uh, ideas, maybe like our universal learning program. But when you get to the end of high school, teachers are teaching to the test by and large, because it's all about performance on these narrow academic metrics. And so the whole concept of, you know, what a good teacher is becomes pressurized by this uh, straitjacket that is focused on grades, on uh, narrow high stakes assessment scores. And that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's a, a, a really perverse and strange uh, consequence of this pathway that's been designed. And it always amuses me when I see, you know, discourses of our 21st century education and skills and all these great things that are happening. Because on the ground, in almost every school, students are leading, or are they headed, should I say, to that, that high school destination, which is stressful, performance orientated, it's drowning out so many passions, it's causing unimaginative teaching to the test. So that's the observation. Now the analysis, okay, this is the second part. The analysis is that, um, the real problem, it's the high school transcript, or if you like, university admissions requirements, which tend to be in states, and as we know, you know, the United States is well known for its holistic approach, you're interested in the whole person, you know, colleges are different, schools are different, what they're looking for, but it, it, it's, it's a lot more holistic than it is in Europe. Uh, and in many other parts of the world. But even there, the extraordinary things that students have done outside of school, and of course now there's pressure on them to do this in addition to academics, so it's not necessarily something that's pleasurable, sort of needed. It, 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 it comes across in a personal statement, maybe um, 
some extra information that university admissions uh, personnel and deans would be able to look at for possibly 10 minutes and then move on. The high school transcript needs to be changed if we really want a 21st century education. Otherwise, what's going to happen is there'll be a lot of talk, there'll be a lot of additions to the curriculum, but it'll all end up the way it has been for several decades now, which is this um, soul-crushing rush to examination performance right at the end. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not going to throw out the window all of the important intellectual and social constructs that come with an examination board. I think you know, being able to perform well on an assessment is important. Being able to write an essay, um, a commentary, uh, to do a test, to to show that you can generalize the knowledge that you have a uh, uh, that, 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 that you've been storing over over a number of years. Um, and I do think that knowledge is absolutely vital. I think these anti-knowledge discourses are extremely pernicious and will lead to a, a, a society that will uh, be manipulated very easily. Um, however, we have to strike a balance between these grades, these cold symbols that sum up the existence of a human being for something like 16 years um, and everything else that's happening. And of course, we know that you know, young people today are doing all sorts of incredible things. There's entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship. They're involved in um, you know, things like YouTubing. Um, some of them are even trading. Uh, you've obviously got a lot of uh, work in the arts um, and sometimes at a very high level in, in sports. Um, you just look at the recent Olympics. You know, you've got athletes who are 17, 18 years old performing in the Olympics. So. Um, how can we design a system that recognizes all of these different talents? The analysis is that the high school transcript must be more inclusive. And this is where it gets interesting because, and it touches on elitism in education. You know, we know that academic skills that are essentially uh, related to literacy and numeracy uh, will favor the middle class children or children in a virtuous cycle of education where their parents are well educated and therefore they get the kind of support at home to allow them to do better on the uh, formal assessments that we're putting them in front of um, whereas you know raw talent uh, and gifts that fall outside of that uh, remit that is so controlled by numeracy and literacy they're often lost and you know any any course on gifted education shows you that many gifted people, not only do they leave school early or they're thrown out of school, they drop out of school, um, but they actually feel rejected by society. And quite a few deviant people, in fact, in the world have gifts that weren't able to flourish in this extremely narrow, unimaginative system. So it's, it's not just about opening uh, the credit system to the things that students are already doing and getting to know them better, it's about letting more stars shine. It's about letting more wings uh, spread and, and letting more people fly. And not just the ones that perform well on these academic tasks. And actually the ones who've already been favored socioeconomically by a background that predicts uh, performance on these tasks. So a lot of research to show that things like grammar schools, um, even bursary programs, a lot of them aren't actually making the types of inroads that they should because they're still um, working off some kind of social uh, home advantage. So it'll, it'll make schools more inclusive as well if we can rethink what's happening right at the end. So let's get to the conclusion, what to do. So what I thought we should do in my school was see what other schools are doing. So we reached out to, um, at the end, about 40 different schools, and we set up a coalition. We call the coalition uh, of schools to honor all learning. And what you've got are a number of different projects that are uh, in the wings and are being developed in schools. You've got global citizenship programs happening, for example, at uh, Yokohama International School. Uh, you've got uh, a type of UWC diploma happening at the United World Colleges. You've got um, this group out of Texas called the Digital Promise, where they're using um, 
some of the principles of uh, online banking to get students to bank credits uh, themselves. You've got micro-credentialing happening uh, between universities and schools. There's quite a lot of that in Australia. You've got the mastery transcript, uh, which is a consortium that is uh, moving in that direction. We've set up our own system at the International School of Geneva called the Learner Passport. And it goes all the way back to those competences I was talking about earlier. There's seven of them. And these have been designed by UNESCO's International Bureau of Education, along with about 160 member states. A lot of thinking and research has gone into it. But what we're trying to do is recognize lifelong learning, self-agency, interacting with the world, interacting with diverse tools and resources, interacting with others, multiliterateness, and transdisciplinarity. And we want to capture in those credit areas stories, performances, and fantastic examples of what students are doing and have done, and present this along with an academic transcript to universities. So I'm going to put in the chat our consortium white paper, which describes what the group is trying to do, because we've all got different approaches. And if you'd like to know more about our learner passport, which is what we're doing at our school, get in, get in touch. I'm now working with the Council of International Schools and with a few universities that finally came around uh, from Canada, actually, on us um, formalizing this work so that we can come up with a type of matrix, interactive matrix, that would allow students and university deans to find out what the full story of each applicant is through this alternative credit system. At the end of the day, uh, if we don't move on this, we'll spend more time dumping in the garage of the curriculum all the new gizmos that we've bought, but not having the courage to throw out all the old ones that we're keeping there. And you know who's suffering because of that? The students. Because there's just too much on their plates right now. We have to build a more inclusive society and a more healthy society that allows every star to shine and allows school teachers to be more creative, to be more confident. It's about trust, trust in what a school can credit a student with. It's about open-mindedness, looking for more than performance on these narrow academic metrics. And it could even lead to a more inclusive work admissions environment, you know, where the whole kind of worldview starts to become not, are you the right person for this organization, but how can this organization learn from you since you've got all these new interesting things that you're bringing that we hadn't even thought about? But they've been recognized. They've been recognized at school. They've been recognized at university. And they're not just anecdotal. They're not esoteric. They're actually part of what we're trying to do. So that's the story. And that's, that's what I think we need to be focusing on at high school level and at university level. And I know, you know, I'm not the only one having this discussion, which is a good thing. Um, thanks for your time. I'm going to put in the link. So I'm going to put in the chat this link I was discussing earlier. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. As always. <laughs> As always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody has immediate hot questions for Dr. Hughes before we go into the breakout rooms? I think there was one uh, from Michelle and from Jeanne. Okay. We will take those two, and those two, and then we would go into the breakout room. Paddy, did you have a question? Yes, actually. Okay, sorry, did so Mich I, can we have Michelle go first? Yes, yes we'll let course. Michelle go first. Okay. I wanted to be sure that you have a question. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Hughes. That was really great. And I was keen on following what you, your, your presentation or your talk because many a time we have felt the need to go back. We asked ourselves at the university how we could go back to the um, secondary and high schools to make a difference because you see, we see that there is a need for the students coming into the university to have a different kind of 
knowledge and skills and experience. And we were not getting that. So a key thing to a key way to address this is to revisit the curriculum as you had rightly highlighted. But the question is that as a school principal, how much influence do you have? You are doing a very great thing there talking to every student in the school. I don't know how you manage to do that. You should have, you should be a superman, that you should have some secret somehow. But how do we, how much influence do you have to initiate real change when you, after talking to these students? Because my perception or my thought is that there are other uh, powers at play, there are, there are school boards, there are uh, accreditation requirements. So that's my question. How much influence do you have as a school head to make those changes? Look, um, I think one of the dis disincentives to this type of work uh, is exactly that, where it, it's trying to repair a plane in the air. And a lot of people give up quickly because of it. And they say, well, someone else needs to do it. The government needs to do it or universities need to do it uh, because we'll never manage. But what I saw in this coalition uh, of schools, and these are very interesting schools. There's actually one of them. There's a school in, in Ghana. It's uh, part of it. Um, is that uh, that there, 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 there is quite a lot of work being done because we're not satisfied with the, the system that's been uh, designed. And so what I'm trying to do is to pull them together and to unify their voice and to get some universities to join us because then I think we will have uh, some influence. That's at a kind of macro level. At a school to university level, what we're doing is we've put in place this passport uh, project, which is, it's just come through its first year trial phase. And we're rolling it out for all our year 12s. So that's about 100, and, uh, that's about 300 students year who will be leaving with this different way of describing uh, who they are. But it's zero risk. It's just um, more information that's better packaged than the bare essentials. And we've got the university. Conferences on it. Um, they're talking to universities about it. And we're going to go that way. I mean, to be honest, you know, how much influence do I have right now? Not much. Um, but if, if, if many of us fight for this, I think it's got a better chance of seeing the light of day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Um, somebody else had a question? Je Jennifer, did you have something to say? Janae had a question. Okay, Janae. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you can um, go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Hughes. Great presentation. Um, I was just wondering about, um, you know, on the, I put it in the document, but, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of, um, curriculum development um, for schools around workforce development and specifically um, soft skills and sort of making sure that students are prepared for jobs of the future and career readiness. And I was just wondering if you've seen some intersections um, with the work that you're doing and potential for that. Um, and, it, and also if you think that it's even needed, right? Um, in the work that you're doing to kind of get students um, prepared for uh, workforce or, you know, we, we focus a lot on voc vocational training. Um, what are some of those intersections? Do you see value um, in, in some of that work as well? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, it's subtle because it, it's true that you've got this, uh, you know, this, this craze right now. Um, and the OECD is involved. There's a whole sort of new PISA project, as you know, no doubt. Um, on looking at um, workplace skills and how they can be integrated in a high school um, and you know educational experience and then university experience, the I I think that that's 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 not a bad thing and that that should happen. But my contention it's it's more around um, recognizing and being willing to 
offer credit to experiences that are out of, of, of the, the curriculum, out of the formal curriculum. Um, because it, it, it's sad when, when you have a passion and you're told fairly early on, well, you don't really want to follow that passion. You, you need to be doing this. Uh, and I think it's part of this sort of post-World War II uh, you know, mindset where there's a rational, linear relationship uh, between um, what you need to do and how you can get there. And we know now, and especially with something like COVID, you know, which obviously made all of these clunky, uh, old-fashioned, high-stakes assessment systems fall apart, literally. And it was embarrassing to see how schools and universities were scrapping around for evidence once that had fallen apart. Uh, it, it's made us realize that we do actually have to rewire this and think about human potential, human flourishing differently because we're missing so much potential. This whole Gen Z potential, uh, you know, how much of it is being harnessed in the classroom? Um, and even with the best of efforts, I think when you have these institutionalized uh, sort of um, efforts to integrate skills in existing um, educational structures. So for example, you know, we're going to maybe have a few different subjects and we'll, and we'll, we'll look at these projects and, and you know, we'll, we'll be looking for these types of uh, competences in the subject. Uh, I, I don't think it's enough. I think in fact, the, 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 a transcript that allows a student to bring his, her or their um, passions to the table is, is, is much more simple. <laughs> To, to organize than, you know, having uh, strands and standards and descriptors and, and, and you know, all of these sort of, uh, you know, verbose um, criteria that are going to get lost at the end of the day, because, you know, there's only, st there's only so much information that someone can take. Uh, and when you look at end of high school exams, those things are, are not really being assessed. And, and if we're going to try and assess them through that formal structure, we might get there. But I think we'll still be missing the, the YouTuber or the skateboarder, you know, or the social entrepreneur uh, or the, um, the swimmer. And, you know, the list goes on. We're still not going to get them because it, it, it's not about spreading out these competences in existing subject-specific domains. It's about opening the door wider. There's so many things going on, that some, some of them we don't even know about, and thinking a bit more creatively around that, particularly in parts of the world where, you know, educational infrastructures are extremely limited, and you've got, you know, extraordinary human talent that isn't being recognized because of that. So that was a bit of a waffly answer, but it was a good question. Thank you. Got me thinking. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hughes. I know we have many more questions that people want to ask. And so, um, and there's lots going on in the chat. And um, so please do, if you continue to have questions, put that in the Google Doc as we will include that in our follow up email. Uh, we will also include contact information for our speakers should you want to contact them directly. Um, but what we always like to do, especially when we have people coming from so many different contexts and cultural contexts, is to just have a time for us to talk with one another. Um, please be cognizant. We have about 20 minutes left. So we're going to take uh, 15 minutes in conversation um, in, in breakout groups, and um, we will um, just assign you randomly to those. But be cognizant of the time and allowing others to, you know, to share, but just reflect on what you've heard and what is one takeaway that you want to bring back to your context or a question that you'd love the group to provide input into. Um, so before I move everyone into your groups, I just want to once again, thank our speakers, Dr. Hughes and Dr. Schneider and Ramirez and Dr. Mabo. Can we just thank them? Thank you. Um, it, it's such a gift, such a gift. So Ruth, any other points before I move people? Okay. Okay, and what have you. And the status that the universities have in these ranking tables. Um, and so much of that is based, it's a little bit like this, well, I think like money, you know, on a belief system. Um, 
I mean, imagine tomorrow and everybody, nobody applied to Harvard. They just said, forget it. We're not, we're not going to apply. What exactly would happen? You know, they'd have to drop their stamps. Um, or imagine everybody suddenly applied to, you know, uh, some of the, 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 the less well uh, known African universities. Um, they would probably go up in the rankings because, you know, they would reject more students and they'd be seen as more prestigious as a whole scarcity principle. So then the next question is, well, why do students apply to these places in the first place? And it's, it's for the kudos, it's for the brand, it's, it's for the, it, it, it's not actually because deep down inside um, the, the quality of instruction and of, of the learning experience is, is at the center. Um, no, it's there, but it's, it's not as central as the brand. I mean, I've got so many students in my school um, and, and, and then there's all culture and guidance, although guidance is, is sort of more and more kind of mindful about this, but parent pressure is along this part of it just wanting to go to these places because of the you know the brand value that's Mm -hmm. it Um, i can attest to that as a student (laughs) yeah 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 that's true that's so true i think uh, i shouldn't say this but anyway i believe that uh, this is not public (laughs) i think there are times when in uh, our board meetings i've argued that um, the advantage that we have had in some areas over other institutions is the brand we have had. I mean, our brand has become very strong. I used those uh, used that argument a few times to point out to other members in the administration that other schools are doing, other institutions are doing something better than we are doing. And as a way to get us, I mean, a wake up call to say, hey, don't get too comfortable because we have established this brand and everybody's coming to it. If we lose sight of those that detail, the quality, then at some point you may find that you start losing students. And when you get to that point, you it's difficult to get them back. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't... Anyway, uh, I think it's fantastic that you're driving a university in, 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 uh, in Cameroon. Um, you know, I, I, well, one of my universities is a South African university, Vits. And I always, whenever I'm presenting, I always say that I'm very proud to have graduated from an African university as well, because we need to celebrate, you know, universities in Africa, uh, in, in India, uh, in different parts of the world and, and prevent this uh, globalized, you know, sort of pathway that's, that's really advantaging, you know, just a small group. So true. Yeah, we can we can uh, continue building that capacity. I think education remains um, the key to, to changing outcomes in different sectors of society. I know it's like a cliche, but that's what is happening. And increasingly, we are having the disconnect between education and the job market. It's like it's changing so fast, and a few times I tell my students that I get this feeling that when I teach you something in the first year, by the time you graduate, it's obsolete. It's, it is, it's, it's useless. So um, I think that even the unemployment rate in, uh, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, is not unrelated to this issue. You have people coming out from the universities in their numbers. University growth has really increased in Africa over the past 20 years significantly. We have moved from a few hundred universities to close to um, 2,000 universities between independence and now. And the student population has practically, I mean, has trebled. But at the same time, there is this huge uh, unemployment um, situation. So the question is, what is happening there? Are there really no jobs? What are these people, all of these people leaving school some live at high school, some continue to the university, come up with degrees. Why can't they find jobs? I think that in answering that question, we'll find that the curriculum has, uh, the school system, let me use that, has failed the students in a certain, a certain degree, has not prepared them for society. I think we are slow at different levels of education to adjust to the rapidly changing community. So when the students leave, they have the degrees, they have the certificates, but they really do not fit into the kind of job and job market that is open to them. 
And at times we want to say that they should be able to create jobs. But the question is, have we in our training prepared them to really be job creators? So um, I agree with you, Dr. Hughes, that the education at some point, you can't help thinking that um, the, it's becoming too business-like, I mean, rather than preparing people for, for life. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, those cases I was, I was quoting earlier, I mean, that's really interesting what you're saying, by the way, this whole sort of explosion of, of universities in Africa. The Australian model, like the UK model, I mean, you know this, and the US model, actually, they, 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 they're funded by international students, by foreign students. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, it's an exogenous uh, uh, business model. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, another thing I've noticed is that there isn't always a correlation between educational standards and, and the economy. You know, you look at, you compare Tunisia and um, Morocco. Uh, Morocco has a much healthier economy than Tunisia, but Tunisia have much better scores on things like Prills and Tims. Uh, you look at Botswana, Botswana doesn't have great literacy and numeracy uh, rates in all the international uh, globally compared studies, but they're incredibly rich. Why? Well, because they protected the diamonds from, from, from the British. Uh, as long as Africa is still in this neo-colonial yoke, uh, where, where we're basically it's being run by, by Europeans and not Chinese, you know, I don't think you're going to break out of that. I mean, I'm not even sure that, that, that quality yeah. universities will do that um, you know we've been sold this idea that obviously because statistically it's true that an education does lead to more opportunity that's true but that the, the the system the political system in, in which that education is delivered is as important um, there's so much to do but it's terrific that you're that you're setting up the university and i can congratulate you for that i can imagine it must be must be a lot of work and a lot of challenges. <laughs> so, it is. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Okay, Rose. Even. I was, I was, um, I, as you, you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm looking back at, at uh, the, the literature review I'm doing for, for the dissertation. And I am, I'm focusing more on, um, I find myself, since I'm doing cultural relevant pedagogies and cultural relevant uh, uh, curricular, I'm starting to wonder what is the role of indigenous knowledge in all of this? Uh, with the European system, it, it's appearing to me that we have lost even the desire to, to take care of our own communities because we are in this system of education that is extremely westernized. And then we set our sights up to look at, if I get this degree, it would take me to America, or it would take me to this. Instead of looking at my environment and going, I'm learning things that are based on my environment, which means when I reproduce, I am reproducing for my environment. But when I go to school, I learn things that are not based on my environment. The moment I graduate, I'm thinking of a place where I'm going to go to be successful or to successfully implement the knowledge that I received in a different environment. So I move now from my environment to go excel in another environment because I don't even know how to excel in my own environment because I wasn't taught the things that are in my environment as a whole, the indigenous knowledge, the love of my own land, how this land is important. Why is it that the highlands in, 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 in Scotland is more appealing to me than the highlands in Bamenda? which when I traveled it, it looks like the perfect same thing, except for a few nice houses here and there. I was like, there's no difference between being in the highlands of Cameroon than the highlands of, of Scotland. But you give a child the option in Cameroon, they will go to the highlands of Scotland and farm and work the farms there than farm the farms in the highlands of Cameroon. What is wrong with our education system? Is it the culture therefore that has forced us to become like this? So that's what I'm pondering in my literature review, in parts of my literature review. <laughs> yeah, I remember another PhD student in the UK asked me, he's from Nigeria, say, Michelle, I'm studying something about snow and people, and where is snow falling in Nigeria?
Well, welcome back, everyone. We always hate to um, close down conversation. Um, as my dear friend Ruth reminded me, um, and I shared before, the uh, good conversations that <laughs> apparently in Ethiopia. So um, we hope you had a rich conversation. Um, and again, we will send out a document that has all of the information from today's um, conversation and questions and or resources. So I've been taking everything from the chat links that you put in and inserting those into this document. Uh, but Ruth, do you want to close us? Uh, yes, um, I was really hoping that we will have time to hear what people discussed in their rooms. So um, I don't know. It's up if, to you. It's up to you. We have to yeah, end. I would in. love. I would love if we could just have one sum, summary of each room. What did you take away? What was the main takeaway from each room? That would be nice. That way, we have a, a bit of um, knowledge from what you gained from your from your discussions. Anybody Any, wants to start? One minute or less. <laughs> yes, one minute or less, please. <laughs> Well, I could start from, I think it was room six, I'm not sure, but um, we, had, uh, uh, we had an individual from Kenya and also from the Congo, Jean and Atamat. And the one thing that we took away was that there is common issues between many countries and bringing in uh, Latin America and Central America and Africa as, and the U.S. show that there are common issues that we should all be involved with. So thank you. I'll go next. Uh, this is Ty Houston. We had in our group four people, three Californians and one Texan, myself. And we spoke about uh, basically the various talks and the takeaways for us. We really liked the idea of what is one's worldview? Are you a post-positivist, positivist? Are you a pragmatist? And how you see the going-ons of the world and how you approach scholarship. Also speaking specifically to Dr. June and of course, Dr. Hughes competencies. Uh, what are those competencies as a leader that we want to see achieved or espouse among our faculty or in the case of the school teachers, um, maybe emotional intelligence skills. We talk about badging for certain skills, uh, having a global mindset and what are the competencies of a global mindset? We also talked about connecting. Dr. Hamilton does a very good job as well. It's kind of like spending 10 minutes with each student. He wants to know a little bit about you and he connects those dots and he knows a lot of people worldwide. So when you come into his classroom, he's probably gonna know someone personally that you know, and then he continues to do that throughout your journey. And lastly, we focused on the identities of young people. How do they self-identify? How are we allowing them to have their light to shine. Maybe it's both tech that's more important. Maybe it's entrepreneurship. We talked about social entrepreneurship. And lastly, just the pressures of life. Where do we fit in in the workplace? Where do we fit in the university? And so um, this all together is just a, a lot to unpack. There's a lot to learn, but environments like this, it makes for a, a more congenial and more, and more connectivity, which is what I value most of all, not to mention a global perspective. That's our talk from our perspective. Thank you. That was fantastic. Well, I'll just come in quickly because I've already spoken, but Ruth was in our breakout uh, group uh, and it was with Michelle and with Archie. Uh, and Michelle was talking about all the work he's doing in Cameroon to set up a university. We just came to this conclusion. It was that, you know, there must be an indigenization of the curriculum. Uh, it's of fundamental importance, especially in the African context, because we're still in a colonial exported knowledge paradigm. Uh, and that is creating a, an education that is ideologically irrelevant for too many people. And there won't be deep change, national uh, connectivity, identity, uh, heritage, uh, continuation mm -hmm. uh, through education. Education is meant to be about the, the transmission of culture at the end of the day. If we don't radically move on, on curriculum content, so to decolonize it first and then to indigenize it. Um,
Totally, I agree because that's my I'm work, my research is centered around that area. Like it was a very fascinating conversation. I'm grateful I was in that room. Anybody else quickly? Nope, doesn't look like anybody wants to go. <laughs> that is okay. So um, thank you so much for, for making the time, for preferring this time of conversation instead of your warm beds for the people that are in the West Coast. Thank you so much for coming and sharing generously your knowledge because most of you could be making thousands of dollars sharing this stuff. So we are grateful that you're generous with your knowledge. Um, may you have a really great week. And until we see you again, thank you from Jennifer, thank you from Dr. Hamilton, and thank you for our, all our speakers. Anybody else want to say anything else? No? Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. And I will hang out and talk.